Once again, the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine brings you The Thirteen Nights of Halloween with Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hey everybody, welcome to another outstanding debacle of the 13 days of Halloween. That's right. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And this is the episode that I warned you about. Or promised you if you're deluded. <laughs> the, the time to share this story from my youth. The scary story that I wrote about. And, you, and the funny thing is you already know. If, if you're one of our three listeners that's listened to like all the episodes, you know the, the backstory of this tale. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. This, is, this goes all the way back to... Uh... Yeah, one of our very first episodes I talked about this and... Crashing stolen cars. I think that was the episode that we talked about this. Wow. Or no, 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 no. It had to be no. I think it was crashing stolen cars. I can't remember was for that sure. The I was gonna say a story. No, crashing stolen cars was like the one by the guy where you're like, this guy's not even out of middle school and he's already published fifteen stories. That's everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy that started that whole trend. Okay. He wrote Crashing Stolen Cars. He was like a freshman in college or something like that. And you're like, oh, here I am, one foot in the grave, and I still haven't published one story. I I hate myself. Wait, this was me? Yes. Anyways. Okay, so this is the story. And, and, you know, I didn't want to do this. I knew I would regret it. (laughs) And I was tempted to sit down and go through the story and fix it, you know, but I was too lazy to do that. Good, because that's not what we wanted. So here we have a story many years old. I was a teenager trying to concoct a scary story. And this, I felt, was a scary story then. And we'll see how it stands up now. All right. The Bend by Rish Outfield The two boys drove along into the pitch black night, the glare of their headlights barely probing the silent dark. All alone, as far as they knew, for dozens, maybe hundreds of miles. The radio had long since gone out of range of any stations and static came unendingly out of the speakers. Neither of the boys turned it off. Brian drove, his eyes focused on the road, but not really watching it, and Dave lay back in his seat, thinking of nothing, as close to sleep as one could come while still conscious. The moon was practically non-existent, and what stars there may have been were cloaked by thick clouds. The Volkswagen's headlights were all that kept them from total, uninterrupted darkness. Inside the car's small trunk were two suitcases, a bag full of clothes, and various other traveling junk. The car was practically silent, which was uncommon for the old VW. The speedometer, gas gauge, and radio left light fluorescent glows which seemed to only accentuate the darkness instead of break it. All was calm. The two boys, both 17 years old, were traveling back to New Mexico from California. They had stopped for gas only four times on the entire trip, and once only six dollars had to be spent. Now, as Brian drove, he glanced at the gas gauge, which hovered a notch above empty. He secretly wished he had stopped about 60 miles back when they had gone through that little town and saw the gas station. But gas had been expensive. And with the way the bug made use of each gallon, Brian hadn't even considered the possibility of it running out of fuel. Should he wake Dave and tell him? Dave, you awake? Brian said, not expecting an answer. After a while, Uh Huh? Are you awake? Another long wait. Yeah. Oh. Brian continued to drive. Every once in a while, he glanced nervously at the fuel gauge. It wasn't going down, but it would, and soon. 
He hadn't been nervous until he got a strange, disquieting feeling when the little car entered a long, dark bend in the road. Dave found slumber impossible. He wanted to sleep, but for some reason the darkness kept him alert instead of dazed. He hadn't seen an electric light in an hour and a half. He hadn't seen anything, for that matter. Nothing but endless rows of field after field after field after field. Nothing but tree after tree and yellow road line after yellow road line. That and the dark. There hadn't been a house for miles. Nothing but endless stretches of road and fence and rocks and trees and field after field after field. The air conditioner was softly going, but still, Dave felt sick to his stomach and dreadfully hot. He didn't feel like turning up the fan, however. He didn't feel like doing anything. Plus, as the little car slowed to go around a rather long bend, he got a feeling deep in his stomach that the boy should not have come this way. Brian? Brian watched the road, his eyes glazed over and seldom blinking. What? Do you know where we are? No. Brian said softly. Oh. They kept driving, down the road, past the winding rows of trees, the long stretches of endless field through the night. Dave? Yeah? Do you remember it being this boring when we came through here before? No, Dave said. But it was day then. It's night now. Yeah. They drove on, the headlights breaking through the darkness just long enough for the VW to move through the temporary light. Do you think we'll have enough gas? said Dave. I'm not sure. Oh. The car moved forward. Outside, the wind blew quietly. The night animals made their lonely calls, but mostly, it was silent. Brian? Dave? The boys said at the same time. What? what? They said again. Each waited for the other to speak. Then Dave spoke. Bri, I have to go to the bathroom. Me too. The boys smiled, and Brian turned on the signal. For some unknown reason. Force of habit, he supposed and pulled the car slowly to the side of the road. We were thinking that at the same time, muttered Dave. Yeah, Brian said, opening his door. A glaring, painful light went soundlessly on when the door came open. Both boys winced and got out of the parked car. Brian looked up at the October sky, at the dark clouds, and listened to the strange, alien environment. Wind whistled quietly, but audibly, through the rows of trees. Somewhere... Water was moving gradually through a rocky path. They could smell the swamp. Brian felt an icy chill that, for some reason, didn't come from the cool fall night. He went about his business quickly and shook off another chill with a crane of his neck. Did you hear something? Dave asked, far away. Something? Yeah, something. Uh... I don't think... Brian turned around, back toward the car, and felt a jolt when he saw someone standing there. It was a boy, by the car, not 50 yards away in the night. Then he was gone. Brian, you okay? Dave asked after Brian's long pause. I, uh, yeah, sure. Brian said. But still, he finished hurriedly and walked speedily back to the car. Dave was also draining himself on the opposite side of the car, closer to one of the long, empty fields that carpeted the surrounding countryside. He too looked up at the gray, lifeless, cloudy October sky. Suddenly, he cocked his head. Had he heard something? Did you hear something? He asked Brian, who was urinating on the other side of the road. Something? Asked Brian whose voice seemed far away. Yeah, he said, not being able to narrow it down to more than that. Something. Uh, I don't... replied Brian. Then he stopped. There was an uncomfortable silence, and Dave's mind began to make pictures out of the noises he heard far away in the night. He had to say something, but what if something had happened to Brian? What if he was... 
Bright, you okay? I... yeah, sure, Brian said, but he sounded nervous, almost shocked. Dave smiled to himself, turned back toward his duty, and almost screamed when he saw a figure standing in the field he was facing. He blinked, alarmed and unsure of what to do, but now it was gone. Or, at least, it had been replaced by a tree. A tree, thought Dave. There was suddenly a light behind him, but it was just the light that went on when the door of the car opened. Brian was in the car. Dave felt terribly alone amidst the fields and trees and cloudy sky. Well, actually not alone, but as if the company with whom he was keeping was not one he wanted to be with. He zipped up and turned back to the car. Dave stopped and listened. But there was only the wind, the baying of a dog, both miles away, and the moonless night. Dave wasted no more time. He darted back to the car and in one desperate, fleeting moment imagined what would happen if it was not Brian who had entered the car, but a ghostly, black... The door opened and a light came on. It was Brian in the driver's seat. And Dave sat down. Are you okay? Brian said. You look sort of pale. I'm fine, said Dave, feeling anything but. Could we just go? Yeah, sure. They did. They had been moving for three or four minutes when Brian glanced down at the gasometer. It was closer to the E now than it was to the three-quarter mark. Are we going to make it? Dave asked while Brian examined the fuel gauge. I'm not sh... Brian glanced up and practically cried out when he looked at Dave. Actually, it wasn't Dave that he was looking at, but the window and the face that was staring in at him through it. A ghostly green, pale, dripping face that was pressed so hard against the glass it seemed to be bending inward. What? What is it? asked Dave desperately. The face was gone, if it was ever there at all. I don't know. I just... Dave, would you drive? Uh, yeah, sure, said Dave, looking startled at Brian. I... I'll just pull over a ways. Over... Brian stuttered, trying to keep his head. Yeah, just pull over a ways up there. The car drove on for several more yards, then Brian signaling again, his little orange light just barely making a hole in the darkness, pulled over to the right side of the road. He did not kill the engine or shut off the lights. In fact, he just sat there, motionless, staring forward for several seconds. He watched the road in front of him, now stopped. There were long, slim weeds that stood slightly bent in front of the car, bathed in the glow of the headlights. Brian found it impossible to look away from them. Suddenly, a breeze came out of nowhere and the weeds began to sway rhythmically back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth in the night. Bry, are you getting out? Dave asked eventually. I, yeah, it's just that I... Did you hear that? Brian asked. Yeah, Dave said. Then, after a short pause, what do you think it was? I don't know. I just know I don't want to meet whatever made it. Yeah, said Dave. He sat there for a moment, then a sudden chill ripped through his body, making him shake violently. What? shouted Brian, watching Dave with wild eyes. I, I don't know. I just had a horrible feeling that we shouldn't get out of the car. Brian looked at Dave, wanting to lock the doors, but afraid that if he turned away from Dave, he would see the horrible long-dead face of the ghastly creature staring wickedly on his side of the car instead of Dave's. That was something he did not want to see. Nonetheless, Brian's window was open a small crack, and a shrill, distant voice solved the problem for him. I'm alone here. 
Brian spun around without looking out the window and slammed his palm down hard on the lock. He turned back to Dave, bracing himself for a ghostly visitor, but saw none. Dave was watching out his window, fogging up the glass with his shallow breath. There's something out there, Brian, he said. Yeah, I know. Dave watched outside. I saw it. Brian said nothing. Dave also stayed silent, watching the endless rows of field after field after field outside. Finally, just to ensure that the next voice he heard was human, Brian said, Yeah, I saw it too. In a hushed voice, Dave spoke. It wants us to go out there. Yeah. Brian, I'm scared. Yeah, me too. Brian whispered. Immediately, Brian got the shocking chill that had racked Dave only moments before. He put his hands against his face and rubbed his eyes. It didn't help. It's so cold out here! Slowly! Both boys spoke at the same time in a moment of eerie perfection. It's closer, they said. Why won't you help me? God, let's get out of here. Dave said all of a sudden. Right, let's go, Brian answered and shifted the car into first. Don't leave me. As a form of habit, much like the signaling for a turn, Brian looked in the rearview mirror. There, staring over the seat, in a moment of mad glee was a horrible green-faced apparition, its black chewed fingernails groping for his neck. Brian cried out and slammed on the brakes. Both he and Dave looked back, but the back seat was crammed with luggage and clothes, nothing more. Dave had seen it too, in the shiny black reflection of the windshield. Holy shit, that thing! It wants to keep us here, Dave said. Why, what does it want from us? Brian asked in mad desperation. As if in answer to their question, the bizarre, childlike voice echoed from around the car, seeping in through every crack and vent. It's a kid, Dave said, which in most situations would not be scary, but in this one was terrifying. Brian was hyperventilating. He breathed in and out, in and out, in and out, but never got enough oxygen. Dave put his hand on his shoulder. Brian flinched. Brian, let's go. Let's get out of here. The boy in the driver's seat was about to speak when a huge, powerful mass slammed up against the back of the VW, jarring both passengers into a frenzy. Go! Go! shouted Dave. Bring this up with me! Brian slammed down on the gas pedal, and the small car lurched forward with a squeal of tires. The childlike voice changed into a snarling, demonic shriek. Come back! Come back! Brian accelerated faster and faster, neglecting to upshift or use the clutch. His lights cut through the thick darkness as he shot through the night like a bottle rocket. The tires squealed again and the gears grinded at every turn. Brian! Dave looked at Brian, his face covered with cold sweat, his eyes opened wide, staring at the swiftly passing road. Brian! There was no reaction from Brian. He just kept driving and staring onward, but not at anything. David! David looked at the speedometer. They were going close to 50. 50 in the dark on an unfamiliar road, in first gear at night, being chased by an unnameable being, out of gas. We're going to go off the road, spin out of control, crash into a rock or or a tree, or, or sink into the depths of an unknown swamp. It's something. Brian! Dave shouted, for some reason, knowing something was about to happen. Brian! You have to stop! Brian! But it was too late. As it registered in Brian's mind that Dave was speaking to him, the lights of the car flashed onto something in the road. Something standing in the road. The car shot forward, and Brian slammed on the brakes as he realized what it was that was blocking their path. A figure. 
The brakes screamed as the two boys propelled at 45 miles an hour toward a dark and quiet figure. It did not dodge or even move. And that's when Dave realized that it was something horrible. Something smiling that was standing there. Stop! screamed Dave. But at that moment, the car slammed into the smiling figure, and its body was thrown up against the hood of the car with a dead thump. But it was not dead. It flipped up against the windshield and scratched its long, wet, dead fingers on the glass and hissed. It was a horrible, decayed thing covered with moss and dripping with swamp water. It pressed its face against the windshield and the boys could see its bug-eaten eyes staring white and lifeless through its swamp green skin. The car finally came to a screeching halt, but the boys were in hysterical terror and did not notice it. They only watched the demonic child thing attempting to mindlessly get at them, hissing and hitting the windshield. After several moments of listening to the boys screaming, the creature rolled off the hood of the car and darted away into the night. Dave came to his senses first. Brian was no longer screaming. He was in a dull, glassy-eyed daze. Brian? Brian? Dave touched his hand, and Brian flailed wildly, gasping and wheezing. Brian, Dave said again. Brian, it's me, it's Dave. Brian choked and breathed shallowly, still hyperventilating, but coming out of the daze. He tried to speak. Uh, where, uh, where, uh, it's gone, said Dave, checking once again to see if the door was locked. I think. It was, it was on the... The window, windshield, I, I had tried, it was... Brian's eyes were wide and wet, but Dave tried to calm him. Shh, it's okay. It's... Suddenly, Dave heard a sound. No, not a sound. A lack of sound. No wind. No engine. No crickets. Nothing. It was the same still silence that it seemed too unnatural, too quiet before. Brian stopped breathing for a moment. Yes, he heard it too. It's back, he said, almost back to normal. Without warning, Brian grabbed the key and turned it sharply forward. The engine tried futilely to start, but it would not turn over. The gas gauge read, empty. Dave swallowed. The car had become too small, too compact, as if they were buried in it. He feared he might be sick. He wanted to get out, desperately to get out. He looked at Brian, who was already breathing with difficulty. Icy sweat ran down his brow as his eyes darted spasmodically in every direction. Brian, said Dave, are you okay? I, I think I'm going to be sick. Brian said in a quivering voice. No, don't think about it. Uh, Brian! I, I, I can't. I, I, I'm gonna... Dave, too, felt his stomach lurch and turn over. The car was hot and incredibly uncomfortable. It felt like someone died in there. Or would soon. Dave? Brian said. He was green. Brian, don't throw up, Dave said. If Brian threw up, Dave knew he would. If you have to... Puke, just roll down the... No! Brian almost shouted. It, it'll get in. It knows you're scared, Bri. I'm scared, too. We just... We can't let it get to us. Think... Oh, happy thoughts? Dave groaned inside at that last comment. How could someone think happy thoughts when they were stranded in the middle of nowhere with no gas, trapped in a stuffy, crypt-like car, and stalked by something that was neither a boy nor a man, neither alive nor dead? What are you? shouted Brian, severely startling Dave. There was a pause. Answer me! Play with me! Come out and play with me! What are you? Brian cried again. I was in the water. I was all alone. I couldn't swim. I'm alone. What do you want? Dave said loudly. There was a long pause. Then... I want you to play with me. (laughs) 
That was followed by a horrible, demented giggle, which continued for a long, long time. Dave looked at Brian. Brian checked to see if his door was locked. Dave did the same. Come in the water. Brian was shivering. Dave, too, was more scared than he could ever remember. The way it echoed so unnaturally around them, it was almost as if the creature was inside the car. Dave was afraid to look behind him. Maybe the boy would be there, pressed up against the back windshield, his worm-eaten eyes staring into Dave's own, green saliva oozing slowly between the yellow teeth in the creature's mouth. Dave's mind could not handle seeing something like that. Okay, well, come out! I'm going to find you! The car began to shake, softly at first, then stronger, until finally the rattling was so violent that Brian had to hold on to the steering wheel to keep from flying against something. Suddenly, the lock next to Brian popped up with a click. Brian, the the door! Brian slammed his hand down on the lock, but Dave's jumped up as if to make up for it. Dave slammed it down and Brian's popped up again as the car shook. As the car shook, the boys had to hold the locks down with both hands to keep the creature from getting in. There was a smashing sound in front of them and both headlights went out leaving them in only the slight glow of the radio and gauges on the dashboard. The car began to rock back and forth, while outside a child's tantrum-like squeals and cursings were quite audible. A large, lightning-shaped crack appeared in the back window. Something large landed on the roof and banged for several seconds. Then the child's ghostly face tipped down to stare at them through the windshield. Dave was screaming. Brian was just holding down the lock and closing his eyes, mumbling to himself. Just then, Brian's window began to roll itself down. Long, dripping fingers with bitten black fingernails reached their way inside. Brian, the window! shouted Dave, but Brian was quite out of it. Dave reached over and wrenched his wrist trying to roll up the window. Seeing its opportunity, Dave's lock popped up and the door began to open. Dave pulled it shut as fast as he could and locked it, but Brian's windows began to roll down twice as fast, making up for the lost time. Brian! Dave screamed. Listen to me! You've got to do your part or it'll get us both! Brian looked at Dave and his eyes cleared for a moment. Then he turned his head and cried out. Long, spotted, skeleton-like arms were reaching in for him. He batted at them and seemed to regain his senses. Dave shouted, The window! And Brian rolled up the window with one hand and held down the lock with the other. But it was not enough. The arms pried in, harder and harder, until the window shattered with the pressure. Dave was rained with broken glass. The arms groped Brian and grasped him. He tried to scream. Dave reached out his hand, but Brian was already gone. The rocking stopped. David was alone. Bry, he said to the empty car. Dave breathed shallowly. He knew the thing would be back. And with a broken window, it would get him just as easily. There was only one thing to do. Help Brian. Dave unlocked the door and stepped out. The wind blew quietly around him. On his side of the road, he saw the exact same field and the exact same trees he had seen when they had stopped before, or some like them. He could smell swamp water and cross to the other side of the road. There, about 20 feet out, was a gray, misty pond surrounded by twisted and dead trees. In the middle of the dark waters was Brian, floating face down. He was already dead. There was an eerie bubbling, and something horrible rose from the water. It was the shape and size of a little boy. Oh, you you do? do It said in a vile, croaking voice that was only made worse when Dave saw that it really was a child. 
the thing reached out its dripping arms. Come on in. That's a thing. The authorities never found any bodies. They found the VW, though, out of gas and only ten miles out of town. The back windshield was cracked, and the headlights and part of the driver's side window were broken. The passenger door was open. It was the only accident there had been there since a boy had disappeared in that area eight years before. They hadn't found any bodies that time, either. The car was towed away and the police tried to contact the owners, hoping they would shed some light on the mystery. No one noticed a muddy handprint on the front window of the Volkswagen. The handprint of a child. Should we just come back tomorrow and talk about this? You know, we could. Yeah. Do it in the next episode. Just chill till the next episode. I, I just, my guess is that we'll talk a long time. You think so? Because there's just so much. To... <laughs> I don't know that we'll talk that long about it. Unless okay. you really have a lot to say. Uh, to be continued. Okay. See you tomorrow, folks. That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Apparently, the creative in creative comments doesn't mean anything. All right. <clears throat> the Bend by Rish L. Outfield. Richelieu. Oh, wait. Are you really recording? Okay, but we're going to do this at like an episode. Oh, you want to intro it first? Right? Okay. Well, we got to warn people. They don't want to accidentally hear a story by me. That's true. That would suck. It'd be like the Doonsty six months from now. You know, that's, that's not so <laughs> That's not what they want. Nobody wants that.